This is an intimate gathering, isn't it? The three or four of us who are still here. Thank you for staying for the very last keynote. And I want to just make sure everything looks like it's working. What do you think? Is this good? Yeah, OK. So can you hear me on the back row? And is that echo gone? I hope. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? OK, good. Can you see the slide, the very first slide? Yes? Yes. OK. So this is the most important slide in a way because, I hope, it has my contact information on it. And I know that as soon as I'm finished, you're out of here. You're going to find a cold beer and a place to relax. And you probably don't want to hang around and ask questions or talk about anything that happens to be of interest in the talk. So I, I will say goodbye now because I know you're going to be soon on your way out the door. But if you do think of something that you would like to talk about, whether it has to do with agile or patterns or change or retrospectives or how your brain works, then you've got my email address. So you can send me some email and say, Linda, I heard you talk in Budapest and it was wonderful. And I just have a few questions. So write down the email address. All right, here's the next. Yeah, good, OK. So this is a talk that I gave for the first time in the large uh, Agile conference in the United States in 2011. And again, I was the closing keynote. And on my way up to the stage, I was even then debating with myself, saying, Linda, you've done it. This is another one of those weird talks. Probably nobody will ever want to hear this one again. It is so weird, and the connection with Agile software seems to be so remote, even for me. I had a hard time explaining it to myself, that I thought, this will be it. This will be my swan song for this particular talk. Little did I know that I have given this talk now more times than I care to think about. And often when I go to a conference, they say, well, we would like you to come give a talk. And I say, great, here's a list of things that I talk about. And they say, no, 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 we want you to talk about the Agile mindset. So even if I don't list it as an alternative, it's the one that most people seem to want to hear. It's changed over time. But I have learned a lot about the topic, and it's changed my life. And I don't know if it will change your life or not. But if it does, would you send me some email? Now what I like is that I do get lots of email about the topic. I get lots of stories about people and how they have become a little more agile how they think differently about their children. It turns out to be a talk mostly about children and about what we say to our children and how we educate our children. So that was a surprise to me. I know I talked about research involving children, but it turns out that's what resonates most with people. So please share your stories with me. The other thing I've learned is that I cannot give this talk everywhere, even though it seems that's what I do these days, is give this talk everywhere. So I make you a gift at the close of the conference that if you feel, oh, I wish my colleagues at work, I wish my family had been here. I wish the people who are members of my organization had been here to hear this talk. I know it's being recorded, and you can Google and find it online. Just Google Linda Rising Agile Mindset. But my gift is that I will be happy to send you the PowerPoint so that if you want to sit down with your family or your colleagues, my slides are very boring. So you should be able to find your way through the presentation and give it yourself. And when I make that gift, I say you own it now. 
there's no copyright on it. If you want to change it and make it more Hungarian, that's okay. You can do anything you want with it. You will own it. So send me some email, tell me your stories, and say, Linda, could you send me a copy of that PowerPoint? And I'll be happy to do that. So what is the Agile Mindset all about? Basically, it's the question up there asking you how you think about people who are smart. We've heard a lot of talk today about smart people, hiring smart people, trying to identify smart people. So what do you think? You've got a choice. One response or the other. Do you think that people are born with intelligence and that whatever intelligence they have, there's not really a whole lot they can do to change that? It's fixed. People are smart or they're not. That's the way it is. It's uh, kind of the luck of the draw, the roll of the dice. Some people are born smart, others, well, not so smart. The other alternative up here on the first slide is, well, yes, we know there are differences among people, clearly. Some people are born, obviously, very talented, very smart, but we want to also add to that the belief that we know that however smart you are today, you can get better tomorrow if you're determined, if you work hard. So those are the two attitudes. And we could be talking about intelligence, we could be talking about talent. And the words in the research are fixed and growth. So I'm gonna tell you about some experiments that have to do with those two mindsets. So let's just review. The one mindset says, yes, you are born with certain abilities. There's absolutely nothing you can do about it. The other says, of course, there are differences among people, but we can all get better if we just work hard, if we try. We can improve at whatever it is, any talent or any ability. So I'm gonna tell you about some experiments it's a series of experiments that have been done over and over again with children, with sports teams, with business organizations, showing the effect of holding one or the other of these two mindsets. So all of the experiments start out in exactly the same way. The children, the sports teams, the organizations are given some kind of test and the test is very easy. Everyone in the experiment does well. So that's phase one. At the end of phase one, and I will come back to this, so you'll have to hang on. I will come back to this. At the end of phase one, now we're going to have a controlled experiment. About 50% of the people who are involved in the experiment will be put into the category of fixed mindset and the others into the category of agile mindset. So now we have two separate groups. I will tell you how that's done when we get to the end of the experiment. So just hang on for a minute because that's the question you have in your minds right now. Okay. Phase two. The two groups were asked we're gonna do something different now. We're gonna give you either a very difficult test or you could have a choice. We could do something very easy. Kind of like the test that you just had where everyone did well. Now, all we've done so far is give an easy test and somehow, we are not sure how, we've put these two groups together fixed and growth. So we haven't really done a whole lot. Would you think that the answer to this question would be significantly different for the two groups? What do you think? Yeah. 
No, they don't. No, they don't. The people who are participating, I'm using students as an example, a stand-in, if you will, sort of a generic name. The students, the sports teams, the people in business have no idea. In fact, let this be a warning to you. If you ever sign up for an experiment in psychology, they will tell you something, but it has nothing to do with real reason for the experiment. Yeah. yeah. So who knows what they were really told, but they've already been put into two groups. So now they're measuring their response. What do you think? What do you think? Any difference here? Do you want to take a really, really hard test? Or do you want to take another easy test? Yes, no, yes, no. No, no, no what? <laughs> Ah, uh, I can't fool you guys. It's the end of the day. But. So what was interesting is that those students who had been put into the growth category, almost all of them said, oh no, I, I want that difficult test. One of the other students said, no, no, I, I, I don't want that. I don't want that difficult. I want the easy test. So what would be the explanation for that radical response of very different? Why? I guess because the one is in the road, they, they are seeking for opportunities. Yeah, it turns out that the attitude that you have toward any talent or ability has wide-ranging effects. And one of the impacts is the feeling that if I know that I can get better by doing something, by working hard, then giving me a challenge, giving me something where I might have to struggle and not even do well, would help me get better at whatever it is. It might help my golf game, it might help my music, it might help my programming skills. The challenge, in other words, is a chance to learn something. What about the other mindset, the fixed mindset? Why would the choice be so radically different? Why would they say, no, 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 I don't want that difficult test. I want the easy test. Well, and, and also they know that if they take the easy test, they'll look good, won't they? And so if you have the fixed mindset, then you believe you have a fixed amount of intelligence or talent. And so if you show other people that you look good at whatever it is, then that's an indication that you have it. So it becomes a goal of those with a fixed mindset to always look good. So right away we can see the impact of just a random assignment. This is a controlled experiment where randomly these students have been put into one group or another and it has already affected the kinds of ways they see what sorts of challenges they want to have and how they view things that might be difficult. Phase three, ah, they lied. They gave both groups a difficult test anyway. See, I told you. They're going to tell you one thing, and they're going to do something else. So they gave them a very difficult test, and they monitored. They said, we would like you to talk out loud. Talk to yourself while you're taking the difficult test. And what they saw is that those students who were in the growth group encouraged themselves. They said, oh, this is such a difficult test. I, I better slow down. I better think about this. Maybe I, I could ask for help. The teacher might help me if I don't understand some of these difficult questions. They coached themselves. They encouraged themselves. Well, what about the students in the other group? Well, they were taking the same difficult test. They were struggling, obviously. And when they listened, to what those students who had been put randomly into the fixed category, they said things like, oh, this is so hard. 
I can't do it. I must be stupid. You know, we, we all have these little voices in our heads. And when we run into challenging situations, that little voice sometimes sounds more or less like those two categories of coaching or berating ourselves. Turns out that's not really us. That's, oh, it's some teacher or it's a parent. Somebody told us at one time, well, you can't do that. You're not very smart. You might as well not even try. Do you have a little voice in your head? I have one. I think we all have one. Phase four. Well, we had that difficult test. Now we've graded the exams and we have a choice now. You could look at those exams of the people who did better than you or you can look at the exams of those people who didn't do as well. What do you think? Mm, you see the pattern now, don't you? Yeah, who wants to see what? Growth? Yeah, the, which one does the growth want to see? Yeah, they say, I want to see the people who did better than I did because that's my chance to learn. I obviously didn't do as well as these people, so if I look at what they did, I could learn something from their answers. That's a chance for me to get better. And, and why then would the fixed say, no, 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 I don't want to see those exams. I want to see the other exams. Why would that be? What? Yeah, I would say, oh, well, they're not as good as I am. I'm smarter than those people. I look good compared to those people. Yeah, and that's exactly how. Yes. Phase five. Now they're given another easy test, just pretty much the way we started out, so we've come full circle, and they notice a very strange thing. It was an easy test. They all did well in the very beginning, but what they saw is that those who had been put into the growth category, they got better. By going through the experience of the struggle with the difficult test, they somehow got smarter in a way, I guess you could say. Whereas those who had been randomly assigned to the fixed mindset, they took another easy test and they, they didn't do as well. They, they sort of became more stupid <laughs> in a short period of time. Phase six, they said, we're gonna do this experiment again and there will be other students or other sports figures or there'll be other business people who are gonna take it. We would like you to write a letter to those subjects in the future and tell them what your experience was like and if you like, you could give them some advice based on your experience. And if you want to, you could even tell them what your scores were on the exams. So they noticed that the growth students, they said, oh, you're gonna take a hard test it's going to be a real struggle and a challenge for you. But you know, if you just slow down, if you take your time, if you ask for help, if you don't understand something, you'll probably be okay. They were coaching the students in the future. They were as helpful to those students they didn't know and would never meet as they had been to themselves. 
what we find is that those who have the growth mindset or the fixed mindset not only apply those categories or those ideas about intelligence or talent to themselves, but they strongly apply them to others. It's a form of stereotyping. Well, unfortunately, the fixed student said, oh, you're going to take a difficult test, probably not going to do very well. But that's just the way it is. You know, some people are smart and they do okay, and others, well, you know, we don't do as well. And then they lied about their test scores. So we see that a lot in fixed mindset. If I'm not really sure how good I am, I want to make sure that I do everything I can to look as good. And sometimes that means inflating my performance somehow. Sometimes it means making other people look bad. I might go out of my way to make other people look bad. This is from the research of Carol Dweck. And when I gave the talk in 2011, I recommended this book. I still do. But now, since I'm bombarded constantly with information about this research, I can tell you there's a lot more out there that's being carried on by uh, Carol Dweck's graduate students. And at least in the United States, there's a huge website for how mindset is being applied into schools. And I know that anybody can access that. And you can look at it as well if you have children and if you're interested in education. The book I just finished reading, I thought I would finish it so I could give it away and not have to carry it home, but I'm not quite done taking my notes. It's a study of how children around the globe are performing. Now, Mary's talk this morning, it's so great. I, you, know, you know, Mary and I love each other. That's why we're always together. <laughs> I let Mary open and then I can say, yeah, Mary said, Mary said, yeah. She said it's not about okay, a lot of the issues that we used to think, it's about problem solving. We want people who can solve problems. And one of the things we measure, unfortunately, is not problem solving, we measure memorizing content. So American schools spend a lot of time on memorize this material and then we'll test you over it. That does not teach problem solving. That does not teach creativity. It doesn't even have anything to do with creativity. So now they're starting to measure children all around the globe. And what they see is that there are some countries where children are encouraged not just to repeat back information or memorize lists. Now the focus is on how to solve problems, how to be creative. And the number one country in the world is not the US, we're not even close. It is, what do you, who do you suppose, number one? Finland, yes, Finland, number one. Finland number one, and in the top, you know, the, the numbers kind of go up and down right now, but I was just in Poland, so it's among the top five, as well as, any guesses? It's not an educational system we want to emulate, but they do produce great problem solvers. No, no. No, South Korea, South Korea. So if you know anything about their educational system, which I didn't in 2011, but now all of a sudden, I'm really interested in what we do with our children and how we teach them because therein lies not just the hope for the United States, but our hope is what are we teaching our children and how are we teaching them? So Poland was really happy, they didn't even know I don't know where Hungary is in there. What do you think? Mm, I, I don't know. It, it wasn't um, among the stories in this book where they just picked example countries. But anyway, I recommend it. These are all free and available. On, and who won the book by Poe Bronson? Is that person still here? 
No, okay, it was one in, in the drawing. There was a book by Poe, okay, by Poe Bronson. So his article, How Not to Talk to Your Kids, is in that book, and in fact, that, that's a really interesting book with lots of research about what, what we do with our children and how we produce problem solvers or not. So you can all access that. And remember, I'll send you the PowerPoint. You can have it, you don't have to take a picture or write down any of that. So there's a lot more than I gave in 2011. Those are online, free resources. There are things for teachers now, as well as parents. So here's the difference. And now I'm gonna discard growth because for me the connection was agile. That we have the fixed mindset and the agile mindset. And what a difference. So remember the basic belief is that if you hold the fixed mindset, you be that all talent, all intelligence, well, it's fixed. It's like your height. There's absolutely nothing you can do about your height. You are born at a certain height and you grow up to reach your maximum height and that's it. I did have a friend once who wanted to be taller and every night she would hide in the closet and she would try to stretch herself out by hanging on the closet bar. It didn't work, so don't do that. It's probably not very healthy. On the other hand, those who hold the agile mindset believe, no, 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 intelligence, talent, it's like a muscle. And one of the most encouraging results now from medicine, at least encouraging from my standpoint, is they used to say that you began losing muscle, oh, about 35. And it was downhill from there. So how many of you are 35 or under? Is that most people in the room? Ah, so young, you're so young. So the good news now is that that's not true. The good news is that muscle is exactly like any other agile ability, that you can continue building muscle until you die. If, does not come for free, if you work at it. So that's why, at least when I'm home, I work out every day and when I'm on the road, I always take the stairs. So in Poland, I just celebrated my 73rd birthday. So this is what 73 looks like, and I could do 10 push-ups for you. <laughs> so muscle and any talent or ability, as long as you work at That's the truth. If we want to talk about the real difference between the agile mindset and the fixed mindset, it would be truth. The truth is the agile mindset is right. That any talent or ability or muscle or brain can grow if you work at it. So the consequences of that are pretty severe, as we've already seen in the experiment. If you're holding the fixed mindset, then your goal is always to look good. Because that's a sign to the rest of the world that you have it. And if you believe that your talent or ability is fixed, then your only hope is that everyone else believes that you have a lot of that talent or ability. So you want to always look good. Whereas the goal for those with the agile mindset is, I want to get better. I want to improve. I want to learn. The challenge, uh, something to avoid. We don't want to take a chance that we might not look good. So those with the fixed mindset say, no, no, I don't want to take that difficult test. Those with the agile mindset say, yes, bring it on. Let me have the challenge. Let me have the opportunity to get better. More importantly, and where it fits in with Agile, of course, I think all of this is to do with Agile, failure. It happens so often that someone with a fixed mindset will not do well at something, will fail, just as the children who took the difficult test, and the first thing that came out was, I must be stupid. I can't do this. 
So the reaction to any kind of challenge that results in failure is to take on failure as an identity. I must not have it. Whereas those for the agile mindset say, oh, I didn't do so well. What can I learn from this? One of the hardest things we have to do with agile teams and the idea of experimenting is to make sure they understand that not all experiments will succeed. I don't know where we got the idea that just because you say experiment, that means try what I think already works so that I can show other people that it's okay. No, if it's an experiment, there should be an hypothesis and the possibility that it might not work, that you might fail. But that's good, it will provide information one way or the other, and that's why you're doing the experiment. Effort, we'll talk about Stephen Hawking in a minute. Effort, well, that's for people who don't have it. Effort for an agile person, well, that's how you get better. You exert effort. And then finally, the reaction to challenge, this is actually a, an official psychology term, helplessness, learned helplessness. I guess I can't do it. Whereas those who are agile, they bounce back. They're resilient. So what an enormous collection of attributes all resulting from the holding of what seems like a fairly simple, innocuous idea about talent or ability or intelligence. You believe you can grow, you believe it's fixed, and now your whole mindset, your worldview for everything has been affected. So the other connection for me had nothing to do with Agile, really. It had to do with children. So have you probably figured this out? At one time, I was a bright little girl. And at least in my day, bright little girls had a real struggle if they were gonna take a science class, especially physics. I can remember my college class in physics, there were 600 people. It was at the University of Kansas, and it was one of those entrance level classes. 600 people, three women. Women just didn't go into physics or chemistry. I was actually working toward a degree in chemistry and that's how I started life. My professional life was as a chemist. There just weren't very many women in science. So I've always wondered why. I, I think women are capable. Wouldn't they be interested in math and science, computer science? Why would there not be so many women there? I, and with the, the other thing that's interesting is to notice the difference between Eastern Europe and the United States. Doesn't seem to be as much a problem for you. So now I look at Carol Dweck's research and she points out something very interesting about bright little girls. So bright little girls in the beginning, well, they have certain skills and abilities that are a little bit different from bright little boys. They're good communicators. They usually learn to speak pretty early. They're also very empathetic. They know what their parents want. They know what their teachers want, what their grandparents want. They know exactly how to manipulate them, maybe, would they? Just a little bit. Yeah, and over and over again, those parents, those grandparents, those teachers, since they see how smart these bright little girls are, they tell them, oh, you're so smart. You're so cute. You could do anything. You could be anything. Do you do that in Hungary? You tell your bright little girls, yeah, that. We certainly do that in the United States. It started heavy duty in the 70s with the self-esteem movement. We thought it was a good thing to do because we want to encourage those bright little girls. So we'll tell them over and over and over how smart they are. 
The research on bright little girls shows something very interesting. Because they have been told since they were this high that they're so bright and they're so smart, they're so pretty, these as a cohort, that means as a group for, for study, as a cohort, bright little girls are the most fixed mindset on the planet. They always want to look good. If it's too challenging, they go the other way. In the experiments, when they're given a chance to take a hard test, they never pick it. No, no. I want to be perfect. I want to look good. And what we know is that bright little girls do just fine until about junior high, all of a sudden the math and the science, they start to get really challenging and they don't do so well because it's really, it's just hard stuff. And they then immediately remember the response for the fixed mindset that they don't do well. They say, I can't, I can't, I must be stupid. I can't do this. And they go away and they go over to do something that's a little bit easier for them or anyway, they leave math and science. Seemed to make a lot of sense to me. I can remember that struggle going to junior high. Actually, the problem is, and I'm gonna ask Mary if this is true, my parents never said, oh, you're so smart. My parents had 11 children. <laughs> <laughs> Did they ever talk to you, Mary? <laughs> Gosh, 11 children. Yes. <laughs> I can hear the voice in my head is my father who's saying, is this the best you can do? <laughs> it didn't matter what it was. Is this the best you can do? And at the time, I hated it. But now, I see what he did for me. He made it okay. Because I knew that regardless of what happened to me, or what subject I took, or what grade, I could take it home, and he was always gonna say the same thing anyway. Is this the best you can do? If you look at my educational career, I, I have a bachelor's degree uh, in chemistry. I have a, almost finished my master's in chemistry. I have a master's in math. I almost finished a PhD in math, and I did finish a PhD in computer science. I think, I'm still hoping that my father, wherever he is, will say, oh, Linda, you did a good job here. <laughs> but that's not gonna happen. So he never said that. My mother never said it. Now in the United States, that's all we say. Oh, you're so smart. Oh, you're so talented. You can do anything. And what we are creating are children with the fixed mindset who crumble at the first challenge. So please, if you have a bright little girl in your house, stop that. I'll tell you what to say in a little bit. Bright little girls, we say, well, Linda, wait a minute. Don't we say the same thing to bright little boys? <laughs> Does that look like an agile project to you? <laughs> bright little boys are told from the beginning by their parents and their teachers and their grandparents, can't you sit still? Look at this paper, it's a mess. Do it over again. Why can't you pay attention when I'm talking to you? Why can't you be more like your sister? <laughs> so when bright little boys get to the hard stuff in junior high, well, they're used to it. 
It's not a challenge for them. They're used to running into hard things and picking themselves up and having another go at it. That's just normal for bright little boys. And in fact, all the research looking at bright little boys has found that they are the most agile cohort. They will take that difficult test. So what have we done? We've created this giant divide by telling those bright little girls over and over and over again how smart they are and how capable that they can do anything. And by telling the bright little boys, as I was told, is this the best you can do? Do this over again. Pay attention. Why can't you be quiet? Why can't you? It was significant for me. I thought maybe we need to pay attention to this. Maybe we need to learn. So here's the really interesting part that will help you with Agile is that it's not just for people. This is about organizations. This is about teams. It's about countries. So we can look at organizations and see they definitely have a fixed mindset. This is the mugshot for Ken Lay. I don't know if you know the Enron story. It's definitely a big, big failure. They had a process they called rank and yank. So they were continually labeling people. You have it, you don't have it. Lining people up. You don't have it, therefore we fire you. And yes, right now you look pretty good, you're at the top, but when we hire new people, you might move to the bottom. It's a continual process of evaluating people and labeling them, oh, you're so smart or you're not, very fixed. And it leads to exactly the kind of thing I mentioned earlier, you want to look good creates a whole organization of people with a fixed mindset. Your job is to look good. And so you'll do just about anything to look good, including sabotage, bring down the entire company, which is what happened, lie, cheat, steal. So you'll look good. So we know mindsets exist at all levels. It's not just about people. It's about marriages, families. Families can have a mindset. Teams, organizations. And one of the nice young ladies who's over here now sketching, she said, put this website up here. Do I have it right? It's H-O-X. Okay, so it should be H-O-X-O. -O. Okay, okay. O-S. Okay. Okay, well, it's something like that. And, and it's called Hero Square. Is that right? Okay. So Hero Square, this has to do with Carol Dweck's research being applied to you your country. Could a country have a mindset? You're, you're nodding, you say, and which is it? You nodded, so I got you. What do you say? Huh? Do you say fixed? Is hungry have, have, have the fixed mindset? Are you saying that? He says yes. Why is that? Okay, well, well, we'll try to correct that before I, ha so it, when you send, when you ask for the PowerPoint, we'll make sure that I have it right. Is, okay, good. And you can also talk to her, say, haven't they been, you know, they need to have a round of applause. These two ladies, aren't they wonderful? Yeah, take a bow, yes. They have done an amazing job how they capture all this. I can't wait to see what this talk looks like over there. I'm just, I'm really excited about that. 
So this is an example of a company. I gave one that has the fixed mindset. Southwest Airlines has been studied over and over and over again. There are so many business case analyses for Southwest Airlines. It is an amazing company. I wish they flew internationally, but they, well, I guess they sort of do, but it's not exactly the same. And when you look at how they hire, when you look at the kinds of things that they are looking for in people, you'll never find, we want the smartest. Looking for labels for people, they look for attitude. Are you somebody who's willing to be open to change? Are you willing to learn? You want to try to get better over time? Do you want to try to help us get better over time? They're definitely agile. They're not looking for some pile of labels to put on people. It is an agile company, and that's the kind of individual they look for in their company are people that have the agile mindset. Once you have adopted one or the other of those, then a lot of other things happen that were kind of a surprise to me. This was an early experiment. There have been so many since. This one was uh, in 1963. Oh, wait, you weren't even born in 1963, were you? No, I didn't think so. Yeah, that's when I graduated from college the first time, yeah, 1963. Wow. So this has to do with, an, remember I said I was a chemist, I lied, I was a biochemist, and I worked in a research lab, and one of my jobs was to go pick up the little rats every day, go up to the fourth floor and bring down a cage with the required number of rats. So I spent a lot of time, I, I know more ways to kill white rats than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> be very careful, be very careful. So I thought this was really interesting. It has to do with white rats. Now, Robert Rosenthal said he was interested in expectation, whether or not your mindset could affect the performance of, and in the beginning he said, well, I wonder if it could affect the performance of rats. So he had two groups of graduate students, and he gave each group a little cage with some rats in it. One group was told, now you're getting some very special rats. These are maze intelligent rats. <laughs> They've been specially bred. Whereas the rats over here, well, he didn't say anything. These are just normal laboratory rats. And he said, now your job is to teach them to run a maze, and we're going to time them. We want to produce some really fast times for the rats. And it's interesting because those graduate students who were given, and these are all, of course, just ordinary rats, but if they were told, oh, your rats are special, that sure enough, the times on solving the maze for those special rats were significantly better than the times for the other rats, even though they were all just ordinary rats. How does that happen? What's the explanation for that? He wasn't sure, but yeah. Yeah, they may, be, may have spent them more time. They might, they might have exhibited a whole host of behaviors to encourage those rats because they believed that those rats were special. And so therefore they should be able to learn how to perform in the maze to some extraordinary ability. Yeah, that what we believe affects how we treat objects in the world, including rats. So then the next experiment had to do with children. And he told teachers in a California school, randomly, oh, the students you're going to have this year, well, some of them, some of them show academic process. They are very, very smart children. Well, the others, no, they're just 
ordinary students. And the basis for this is, well, he said he had given them some kind of special IQ test. So here are the teachers, they have their class of students, and they believe that some of them are special, just like the rats. Or the others, just ordinary students. Well, at the end of the school year, he measured again. He had given them a test. He measured again, and what do you suppose he found? Even though they were all just ordinary rats or ordinary students, Surprisingly, those who had been labeled as special, oh, these, sh these students show academic promise. They did perform better. And how did that happen? Maybe the teachers spent more time with them, but it was the first time that we saw a demonstration of how your mindset and what you believe about the abilities of other people can actually change their behavior because of the way you treat them. Oh, we saw it works with rats and it works with kids. Oh my goodness, could it work with managers? <laughs> I've never been a manager. I started reading some of the research and it said something like, managers make up their minds pretty quickly about whether someone has it or not. Sounds very fixed, doesn't it? Who has it and who does not? Long before they have any real evidence. It's an impression, a gut feeling, who knows where they got it. Maybe somebody came in and said, ah, oh, this person is a special rat. He can run the maze faster. Who knows what they were told? But they got that impression somehow. And then it does affect their performance. Well, this paper that was written in 1988, and I'll not only send you the presentation, but if you don't have these papers and you are a manager or you ever hope to be a manager, you should definitely read it. It's called the Pygmalion Effect, and it means if I have a belief about you, then my belief can actually change your performance. I can make you better or not. How powerful is that? Not only managers, we all do this to each other. Your mindset affects my mindset. My mindset affects yours. I know you can't read it. It's a statement from a guy at Arizona State, which is where I finished my PhD. He's a world-class physicist, and he said, you know, the problem is we teach our children to hold this fixed mindset. We teach them that failure is a bad thing. We teach them that all problems have solutions. That's wrong. Most problems have no solutions, and most problems can't be solved using just technical approaches. He said, when I teach physics, that's all we do, is we give them problems that can all be solved by using technical approaches. We do our students a great disservice. This is how we start. We're all agile in the beginning. In fact, if we were not, we wouldn't be here today. Because this is about falling down, getting up. Falling down again, getting up. Running into furniture, bumping our heads. Having the dog chase us around and learning from that. It's a series of failures that teach us how to walk, how to talk, how to move through the world. And somewhere along the way, we lose it, either because parents begin telling us the wrong thing, or educational systems begin telling us the wrong thing. It seems a little discouraging. Luckily, the research says, you know, we are destined to hold one or the other of the mindsets, but it's not so difficult to move to the one you'd like to hold. 
And in fact, now I'm going to tell you, remember I promised, I said I would tell you how they decided to put those students into two groups. Do you remember that? Yep. Okay. So remember the first phase, phase one was we're going to take an easy test. Everybody's going to do pretty well. And then the students don't know, but they've already been randomly put into two groups. Fixed and agile. So this is a randomized controlled experiment. And to the agile group, I hand back the test and I say, oh, you did really well. You must have worked hard. To the other group, I say, oh, you did really well. You must be smart. That's it. That's all they said. And what Carol Dweck writes about is the first time that experiment was performed, she thought, this is such a small experimental manipulation. Surely it can't have any real measurable effect. All she did was say, you must have worked hard. Oh, you must be smart. And it was enough to get those profound, statistically significant results. A small manipulation like that. So if you're wondering what mindset you hold, and you know we all go back and forth throughout the day, and you say, I wish I were more agile, I'm here to tell you that it's easy to move over to the other side if you're willing to start telling that little voice in your head to say something different tell you something more encouraging. You don't have to be stupid. If that's what the voice in your head has been telling you, you don't have to be stupid. Talk about working hard. Talk about strategizing. Talk about how you thought about something, and do the same thing for your children. Instead of saying, oh, you're so smart, you did really well on this math test, say, oh, I can see you must have been doing your homework. I can see you've been studying hard. I can see that for your musical instrument. You've been practicing. I can see that for your sport. You've been out working hard on your soccer kick or whatever it is. Talk about the effort. Praise the process. Talk about determination and say that failure is absolutely okay. Especially to those bright little girls. Tell them it's okay to fail. They just have to work harder. Stephen Hawking and I are the same age. I saw a documentary about him just recently and he said, you know, when I was a graduate student, Nobody worked. We thought that if we worked, that meant we weren't very smart. Definitely fixed mindset. Said it wasn't until I finished my PhD that I realized that I was now going to have to suddenly knuckle down and do some real work, and I loved it. What a wonderful thing. So they told Stephen Hawking 50 years, wait, do you know who Stephen Hawking is? Okay. They told him 50 years ago he wouldn't live very long, he's still alive. And what does he do all day? He works. It's what's kept him alive. He loves it. But even he started out with the fixed mindset because he'd been told all his life, oh, you're so smart, you're perfect. You're going to do anything. You can do anything. So you can't read this, I know, but you're going to send for the PowerPoint, and on it is a list of things for you to tell your kids. Don't say you're so smart, you're so pretty, you're so talented, you can do anything. Say instead, and I've got a whole page of suggestions for you, this is a report somebody just sent me in school in Oregon is trying to teach their kids to be agile. 
They gave them a very difficult project, and so I copied down some of the things the teachers said. Said, there's going to be a lot of steps here. Some of you are going to fail. It's going to be hard. Another teacher says, this comes down to teachers believing that all students can learn. Very agile. Everybody's going to struggle with something. We have to see everybody as being able to get better through practicing. When one teacher was asked by a student, oh, this is so difficult, I can't do it, can you help me? The teacher said, do you want my brain to grow? <laughs> or do you want your brain to grow? One student says, it makes my brain feel like it has to do more than it used to. Another student said, we can't do this yet, but if we try hard, we will make it. Another student, this might be wrong, but I'm not going to give up. Finally, the teacher who closed off the article said, my biggest hope is that these kids will leave my room loving learning. I hope this is something they will carry with them their whole lives. So that article was about teaching agility, teaching the agile mindset, teaching that you might struggle with this, you might fail, but you're gonna learn something. So this is for other adults in your life and for yourself, things to say. And the connection with Agile for me, of course, is about trying little things and sometimes failing. So I scraped a bunch of websites and I pulled together fail early, fail often, fail fast, learn constantly, that's Agile. Failure is an option. Without failure, how can learning happen? From Rich Sheridan, one of my favorite companies, Menlo Innovations, make mistakes faster. Kent Beck said, perfect is a verb. Perfect, get better. So I hope you got a couple of interesting things at the end of the conference. Was it worth the wait? Are you okay? It's good. All right. So I hope you um, have a nice evening with a cold beer and don't think about anything too hard. And then tomorrow, send me some email. Say, Linda, send me that PowerPoint. I want to start talking to my bright little children and I want to tell them work harder because Hungary needs them. Thank you.